Okay, so hello guys. I'm really grateful to see all of you here today and uh, Today we are going to go through what OpenStack Performance Team is and one very specific experiment we have done during uh, last OpenStack development cycle. So about 1,000 nodes and we of course will cover who's OpenStack Performance Team, who's taking part in it, some quick round of introductions and uh, I hope this session will be really interesting to you guys. But uh, first of all, let's start with some a round of introductions. So my name is Dina Bilova. I am a development manager at Mirantis, currently focusing on performance and scalability researches, including performance and scalability researches of OpenStack. So, Alex? Uh, so my name is Alexander Shaposhnikov. I am a distinguished engineer at the Mirantis, and my main focus is working on the making OpenStack working on a pretty big scale, like 1,000 to 1,000 nodes. So, Matthew? Thanks. So I'm Matthew Simona. I'm working at Inria. I'm um, part of a project called Discovery, and this project aims to uh, study OpenStack to, to see if it fits with the fog or edge computing requirements. So we are very much interested in scaling OpenStack and doing some experiments with multi-site deployments. Cool. So uh, first of all, our today's agenda. We'll go through what OpenStack performance team is, when it was kicked off, what we're doing on a daily basis, and what can you find useful for you guys. Uh, then we'll quite switch to this very specific 1000 nodes emulation experiment, and Alex and Matthew will talk about methodologies, test environments that were used, the observations and the conclusions that we made. At the end of the session, we'll definitely have Q&A session time, and uh, we'll be really glad to answer all your questions. So regarding OpenStack performance team, originally it was kicked off during Mitaka Summit at Tokyo and technically we are part of large deployments team working group. But comparing with large deployments team, we are focused not on running uh, tests, not running OpenStack on huge scale, not on the uh, uh, operators type of questions, not on the development type of questions, not on the deployment type of questions, but on the OpenStack evaluation and defining methodologies of how can you evaluate your OpenStack, define if it's scalable enough, is it performant enough, and if it can fit your workloads you want to run on it. So um, during the time we exist, we run tests on uh, various cases for various OpenStack components and their underlying technologies. And we did it against several test environments. For instance, uh, at Mirantus, we mostly are running tests on two test beds. One is 250 physical machines, the second one is 500 physical machines. Matthew will go through the INRE environment shortly. And um, of course, the tools that we chose uh, to run tests. Uh, depend much on the uh, test nature. So if we're talking about control plane testing of OpenStack, about measuring API latencies of OpenStack components, the most obvious solution to pick will be Rally, basically because it's configurable enough to cover complicated cases and even extended cases like density testing, when we're trying to push as many OpenStack resources as possible to the cloud and check how very primary workloads uh, behave between those resources and uh, how is your control plane and data plane still behaving. If we're talking about reliability testing, we can use combination of Rally and OS false library that allows us to emulate issues with OpenStack, like OpenStack services availability, hardware issues, networking issues, and check how your OpenStack continues to behave on both control plane and data plane layers. Uh, if we're talking about density, uh, sorry, data plane testing, right now we're mostly using Shaker tool that allows you to measure and evaluate OpenStack tenant networking capabilities and um, measure such uh, values as latencies and throughput and all that kind of stuff. As said, we're not only focused on OpenStack itself, but on the underlying technologies like messaging bus, database, and for instance, cluster, uh, container cluster systems like Kubernetes. For instance, if your OpenStack is running on top of Kubernetes, you probably would like to know how your Kubernetes is working. So in that case, of course, we use other tools more specific for that kind of tests. Uh, in short, OpenStack performance team is trying to uh, evaluate OpenStack, define methodologies of how you can do it, and uh, we share our experiments and our experience uh, community-wide in performance documentation. So this is basically part of upstream OpenStack documentation where you can 
uh, find all our tools, methodologies, test plans, test results. And uh, I suppose you can check this link and find something very interesting for you guys because we have very cool researchers regarding reliability tests, regarding neutron, uh, neut neutron, neutron features testing, and uh, regarding, of course, 1,000 nodes testing that guys will be shortly talking about. So, Alex, please proceed. Okay. Thank you, Gina. So, uh, 1,000 nodes experiments, what is it all about? So, first of all, 1,000 nodes means 1,000 of compute nodes. That's the first thing. Uh, most of the current companies are uh, thinking about uh, going with pretty big clouds, like 200 nodes, 500 nodes, and sometimes would be even 1,000 nodes. It's not a big deal previously to build a cloud of 100, uh, 100 or 200 nodes, but usually it requires a lot of the customizations, properly patching, and at some point you're figuring out that you wouldn't be able to go with the newer version of OpenStack because you have to uh, but put some patches and you stack with some kind of very, very customized uh, cluster or your cloud, uh, which you're not able to upgrade and you have to migrate workload to properly new deployed cluster. So at some point, it's pretty tricky to go with a lot of customization. So the be best way is to go with the original upstream cloud. And uh, during the, our evaluation process of current, uh, uh, which was during the Liberty release cycle, so we basically checked out all the testing uh, results that we have in Mirantis Scale Lab, and uh, decided to give it a try, a cloud of 1,000 compute nodes with standard settings without any additional patching of the core services. Uh, take one and every service by one instance. There is no HA proxy. There is not nothing additional for all balancing service. So each and every service, only one instance. And 1,000 of compute nodes. Uh, as you probably know, there is a common approach uh, existing in uh, OpenStack community to put a lot of the control point services, as long as core services like RabbitMQ and MySQL, in the, some particular nodes called controllers. And that will lead to some performance issues on the scale of 200 nodes, because the, these nodes usually a bit overloaded, even if it's very, very kind of top-notch hardware used. So the best approach is go and granulate services and put them on some separate nodes, and as soon as cloud starts growing, that's pretty good. But as long as you have everything initially combined, it's very, very hard to go and move that from the working cloud. And if you start to putting everything, every single service initially on the different nodes, that will be pretty big control point overhead from the beginning of the cloud life cycle. Uh, so we decided to change the paradigm how we deploy it, and we put each and every OpenStack service into the container. Uh, so we use Docker containers. Well, Everyone knows about the benefits of the containers, uh, and it's very kind of uh, simplifies the CI/CD pipeline. It simplifies development. It simplifies upgrades, updates, and even downgrades and rollbacks in case of failures. So we put each and every service into the container, and how it's helped us. We probably kind of well, we get a chance to. Uh, monitor each and every container for the resources consum consumed by this particular service, so it's kind of neutral, Nova, or anything like that. And we also aggregate all the computer-related services, like kind of uh, neutron agent, uh, Nova compute, and live built in one containers, and basically scale that out on top of Mesos plus Marathon uh, to 1,000 of these container instances. So. Because we put everything in the containers, the, we got the benefits of using the pretty simple and the pretty uh, commonly used uh, toolkit of C-Advisor and InfluxDB and Grafana to monitor and measure all the uh, stats. And we basically, after we deployed everything, we run the rally, uh, pretty simple case, it's called boot and list, which actually spawned the VM. Uh, after that, it will pull for its status, and when it's ready, it will just do the list of the VM. So it's kind of mostly no API requests, and do that in, the, uh, in a 50 concurrent threads uh, for the 20,000 of the VMs. Uh, so that's pretty it about the testing environment, so we could probably switch to the uh, describing of the our Mirantis lab for doing that. So it was initially it was Mesos plus Marathon and Docker uh, for the tasks, which are OpenStack services. Uh, that everything was run on 15 nodes, uh, which uh, kind of have two sockets with E5 Xeons 2680, uh, one quarter of terabyte of RAM, and almost one terabyte SSD. So that was the, we took the liberty release of OpenStack because it was during the Mitaka Summit, and we decided to test and uh, 
do that with the kind of, you know, stable branch without going with the development stuff, not to trying to play with kind of properly some features which wasn't completely developed at that moment of time. And the one thing, we modified the libvirt driver. We didn't use the fake one because um, the problem with fake one, it wouldn't retrieve glance image. It wouldn't do the uh, kind of spawning of um, any ports, any preparation, so we modified the original driver and just removed from there and mocked up the part which uh, run the QM or QVM, but still reporting active state to all the VMs, which uh, they at some point should be run it. So it actually do all the ports uh, for the neutron, uh, retrieving glance, I mean retrieving image from glance and stuff around that. So that's pretty it about the, our uh, deployment and branches. So make sure probably just use the uh, their setup and uh, their initial results. Thank you. Uh, so yes, uh, at Inuya we were using pretty much the same idea as uh, Mirantis. Uh, we deployed OpenStack on approximately 30 nodes of a platform called Grid 5000. Uh, it's actually a, a small fraction of the resource that can provide the platform. So if you want some more information about Grid 5000, you can check the performance uh, documentation wiki and you will find all the useful links to, to the resource we got and how to get an access if you want. Um, we use uh, also uh, a containerized deployment. Uh, we were based on the Mitaka release at the time of the experiment. Um, and to be more precise, we used Cola to deploy, uh, to deploy OpenStack on the, on the platform. And actually, we just modified, we just added some new features to ease the experimentation on our platform, like uh, uh, we, we needed, we really need to, uh, to test different topologies of service, reconfigure services on the fly, and so on. So we add this in the in augmented Cola tool, which is available on GitHub. It's, uh, you have the link on, on the bottom of the slide. Uh, as uh, Alex uh, mentioned, we, we, we do make use of uh, the fake drivers on our side um, because it was easier for us uh, to, to, to get this uh, cluster of uh, 1,000 nodes uh, deployed. Uh, but as he mentioned as well, uh, there is one drawback to do that is that, for example, uh, Nova fake driver doesn't implement all the neutron operation on, on virtual machines. So uh, that means that um, uh, evaluating neutron with Nova fake drivers may be not accurate. So that's why I think you, uh, you use uh, the, the modified libvirt driver to do that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So uh, before we dive into more details of the, uh, on the results, uh, I would like to add some more um, elements on the experimentation process we have. Um, so we measure all the resource consumption of the OpenStack services uh, deployed with 1,000 compute nodes. Uh, so we made a set of experimentation with this deployment, with this type of deployment. And for each deployment, uh, we consider three distinct phases. So uh, you have on the left part of the slide, phase one. Uh, which corresponds to a phase where um, OpenStack is freshly deployed. Uh, no resource has been created yet on, on OpenStack, so that means that uh, you don't, you are, you are, no API calls have been made to uh, create VMs or create tenants or create networks and so on. So that means that at this t at, during this phase, OpenStack is uh, just idle and empty. So measuring the resource consumption on this phase is quite interesting because you will see you will, uh, you will evaluate how much it costs for op all the OpenStack services to maintain uh, the state of OpenStack. Um, next, if we move to phase two, phase two is uh, basically the phase where we are injecting some loads into the, uh, the deployed clouds. So as uh, it was uh, mentioned earlier, we use a Rally benchmarking tool to do, to do that. Uh, for the sake of uh, simplicity, we use boot and list uh, scenario with uh, these two key parameters, so 20K iteration and concurrency of 50. So basically at the end of uh, the benchmark, you will, get, uh, you will have uh, 20,000 VMs created by the benchmarks. Uh, so if we move to phase three, phase three is a phase where uh, all the resources have been created by the benchmark, but not yet cleaned by uh, Rally. So uh, in this phase, you will measure basically uh, how much it costs for OpenStack to maintain all the resources created by the, 
by the benchmarks. Um, there is also, we, we could have added a phase four, which could be the, which will be the um, cleanup phase, but it's uh, out of the scope of this presentation here. You will find all the details in the performance documentation wiki, if you want. Uh, okay, so we decided to make uh, this presentation on a per, on a per uh, service basis. So we will go through uh, different, uh, different services uh, like RabbitMQ, MariaDB, and so on. And we will present you some observation and conclusion we, we got uh, on these uh, services. So here, we consider in this slide RabbitMQ in the phase one, so where uh, uh, OpenStack is empty. Uh, what we can observe here, we are, basically we made a set of experiments with different number of compute nodes. So we increase the number of compute nodes and we measure the resource consumption on the RabbitMQ server uh, to see how the resources are varying with the number of compute nodes. So what we can observe here is that uh, with an in the, the resource consumption regarding the core usage and the memory usage is increasing linearly with the number of compute nodes. So we started from 100 compute nodes until 1,000 compute nodes, which the, the, this kind of increase is quite kind of expected. Uh, there, is an also, there is also another key metric to check if you, uh, when you evaluate RabbitMQ, is the number of open connections you have on the RabbitMQ server. So here, the, this graph depicts the number of open connections during the idle phase during the phase one uh, on the RabbitMQ server. So as you can see here, uh, for 1,000 compute nodes, uh, uh, for 1,000 compute nodes deployments, you will have uh, more than uh, um, 15,000 uh, open connection at the same time on the RabbitMQ server. So here, uh, you must pay attention, attention to the fact that you may hit some uh, system limit on basically op the number of open files you have on your system. So you, you may have to tune your system to handle this kind of, uh, this kind of load. So if we move now to the, uh, yeah, if you move now to the phase two, uh, so RabbitMQ on the load. So what we observed during the, our experimentation, so here RabbitMQ was deployed in, in a standalone mode. So we use, we use only one server to, uh, handle the load of uh, all the messages. Um, the, the load we observed uh, during the rally benchmark was load enough, was uh, big enough, sorry, uh, but still it was tolerable. So for example, we, uh, we observe a, uh, a CPU usage of, uh, a core usage of 20 maximum. Uh, if you look at the graph, you'll see that in average, it's more like uh, 10 core use. And uh, RAM was increasing until uh, 17 gigabytes of RAM. Um, during phase three, so where the bench, after the benchmark stopped, um, we can see the effect of the periodic, periodic tasks. So the periodic tasks are basically tasks that are made to maintain the states of OpenStack and all the resources created. So the, the, the cost of this periodic task uh, is evaluated here to be something like between three and four cores and 16 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, if you now move to the same evaluation for the database server, uh, we, we, we just present some uh, highlights. Some, we, don't, we won't go into too much detail here. So what we observe for the database server, so the database server was uh, deployed as a standalone server as well, like uh, RabbitMQ. Uh, we observed that for 1,000 compute nodes, the database footprint was uh, small, even for this number of compute nodes. So you have the number on the three first items, so few cores usage, uh, less than one gig RAM used, less than 200 open connection at the same time. Uh, what is interesting to, to note here is that uh, you can see uh, on the database, direct, you can see the effect of the periodic tasks. Uh, so we measured uh, the, 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 the effect of the periodic task that uh, OpenStack is doing, um, and we evaluated it to approximately uh, 650, 650 requests per second on the database. So this is the effect of the periodic tasks. Uh, if we check now the database on the load, um, 
the conclusion is that the database is behaving correctly. So there is something, some observation to be made uh, nevertheless. Uh, for example, if you check the graph on the top right corner, you will see the number of connections open on the database uh, at a certain point of time. So here we hit something like uh, two, a little bit more than 2,000 connections at the same time. So the similar to RabbitMQ, you may need to tune your uh, MariaDB instance to accept this, uh, this uh, number of connections at the same time. Uh, memory is increasing the same way. It's uh, expected because connection and memory are, are tightly coupled. Um, regarding the cores, the cores usage was quite stable with an average of uh, 0.7 cores used. So if we now move to, uh, to the OpenStack core services, so I will start with the Nova scheduler and Alex will continue with uh, other Nova services. Uh, or Nova OpenStack services. Uh, so if you deploy the 1000 node cluster, you, it's easy to hit the bottleneck regarding the scheduler because, it, the nature, because of the nature of the scheduler. So the scheduler service is a little bit different from the other Nova services, even if, the, if they rely on the same code. Uh, the difference resides in the fact that, for example, uh, for Nova API, uh, Nova API is able to um, leverage multiple workers to handle all the loads, all the incoming requests. Um, so as you can see on the, on the, on the graph here, uh, Nova API is able to use uh, something like 10 calls at a certain point of time to handle all the incoming requests. But for the scheduler, it's quite different because uh, the scheduler, insta uh, scheduler instance is uh, stick with only one worker. So that means that this worker uh, has a lot of job to do, like accepting an, the incoming request. Uh, it, it must take the decision, the placement decision for the VMs, and it, it must also continuously update uh, its uh, internal view uh, of the OpenStack uh, compute nodes. Uh, the view is important because uh, the view is uh, reflect the state of the system, and it, the view has to be up to date to take accurate decision on the placement. So here the scheduler is only using one worker. So there is one workaround to, uh, to, um, to overcome this issue is that you can start several uh, in scheduler instances. So by horizontally scaling your scheduler, you will be able to accept more incoming requests. Uh, there is also one drawback to be aware of if you start several in, in, uh, Nova scheduler instances is that uh, placement decision of two schedulers may collide on a single physical host. So you will maybe increase the number of retries you will have to uh, do to place a VM. So this is the observation for uh, the Nova scheduler. So I will take the mic to Alex. Thank you, Mathieu. So let's switch to the Nova conductor. Um, so that is the most kind of one of the most loaded services in OpenStack. So it's actually have almost no idle timing. As, as long as you have compute nodes, of course. <laughs> so uh, as you could probably see, in phase one, there is almost kind of close to five cores or what. Uh, so it's only about uh, regular reports coming from the compute nodes, which have no instances at the time. And during the phase two, a lot of workloads place it on the compute nodes. And you see the kind of pretty interesting graph, which consists of small spikes and pretty big, huge spikes. So small spikes, it's kind of periodics. It's kind of, it's maybe kind of a little bit, uh, kind of uh, slightly kind of flat, but it's basically every one minute periodic. So it's kind of reports from the compute nodes about the resource available and kind of overall stats. And the huge spikes, it's about uh, uh, 10 minutes periodics. Uh, which kind of reporting the states of the instances. So is a shutdown, active, uh, something like that. So, And as you probably see, all, as, the, as soon as all the workloads place it, there is nothing changed in the conductor because it's still servicing the same periodic task. There is nothing, nothing got changed. Uh, resource consumption is pretty huge. Sometimes it's up to 30 cores, but uh, usually it's somewhere about kind of 10, 12 cores if it's kind of could be averaged. And let's switch to the second service. It would be no API. So no API is pretty kind of predictable. So it consumes a lot of resources during the workload placement. RAM is growing not so significant, so kind of it's, it's pretty expectable. And as you 
probably see it uh, starts a little bit, uh, kind of a little bit shaky at the end, but it's only because of the, uh, uh, as we mentioned it in Raleigh scenario, we're using Nova boot and list. So list is all, all, all the time list are uh, basically returning a pretty huge list of instances. So for Nova API, it's a little bit tricky to handle the stuff. So only because of that, the load on it's a little bit increases. But at the end of the workload placement, you see this pretty stable load, the same periodic stuff. And kind of stuff like that. And in phase four, as you could probably see a little bit, that's very, very critical part. It's when the, no, uh, when the rally starts to clean up all the workloads. And because of that, you, that's such a huge spike. I mean, it does to kind of confirm the thing that's well, you should care not about only workload placement, but kind of active workload putting and removing. So if you have pretty active uh, usage on your cloud, you should take care about the kind of Nova also because it requires a lot of uh, resources. So that's it, and let's switch to the kind of mostly kind of hungry service, neutron server. So uh, most the consumption as we see from the neutron server, it was about 30 cores. Uh, sometimes this could be, as you in cleanup phases, 35 cores. Uh, and that's pretty interesting all the phases. So first phase, as you probably see, it's kind of uh, a lot of the drifting and with pretty high loss. And when it, it's basically the time when the, all the compute nodes got added to the cluster. So during this time, all the compute nodes are reported, all the DVR uh, routers got created, and stuff like that. And then you just before the starting of phase two, there is a spike. That, that is the moment when the uh, rally test prepares the environment and creating uh, users, tenants, and most important, networks. So that's mostly API uh, a lot. And then, uh, the second phase could be divided in two parts. Second uh, is kind of growing, and after that it's falling down and going pretty steady. So first one, it's when the neutron, I mean, basically scheduler trying to uh, fill out all the compute nodes. It's placing one VM per node because it's kind of a pretty free, all, all of them are available. And it's basically kind of neutron trying to tune up each and every DVR and DHCP on each and every server, so only because of that kind of initial load is pretty high because it has to do that first time on the each and every node. But after about 1,000 of VMs got placed, it becomes pretty steady. And it's kind of grown significantly. And after the overclouds got placed, you see that stable load about 10 cores. It's mostly about the RPC stuff from the agent about the status, so it's kind of clear periodics. So that's the everything about the neutron server. So let's switch to the conclusions what we have. So um, what you would like to properly to do for the big OpenStack cloud based on Liberty or new release, and if of course you go and visit the containers. So as you probably know, you could limit resources in containers like cores, memory, and in this case, you probably would like to tune up API or PC workers because by default, servers will grab number of cores from the containers that wouldn't work for you. Uh, or just not to limit cores and know approximately how many cores you will have on some particular system. So you probably would like to set up some particular numbers because it will be clear at least how big the scale for some particular services. Next, MySQL and RabbitMQ wasn't a bottleneck at all, at least. Uh, in terms of the huge resources, I mean consumption. There is a rumors about uh, MySQL or RabbitMQ instability. There is a rumors so that maybe a lack of resources or something like that. It's maybe true if you're using the clustered solution with not enough uh, performance between the, not enough usually network bandwidth and CPU or RAM uh, resources for the cluster of the kind of MySQL or RabbitMQ. But for MySQL, as you could probably see, there is a very, very small impact on the resources. It's consumed, I mean, in our experiments in my, uh, in um, uh, it was about three, four cores in the kind of pretty stressful scenarios. For the RabbitMQ, yes, it took a lot of resources. Cluster solution will took even more because it's half overhead for the cluster, but it, it should work fine still. And main issue is the scheduler performance. So as Matthew already mentioned it, uh, one scheduler is not enough, and multiple schedulers wouldn't work for you because they will have a lot of the race condition in the putting the VMs on the workloads. As far as I know, in the uh, Okata release, there would be um, should be some improvements for the scheduler, which kind of allow it to go and be at least working on the multi-thread course in some. Uh, 
with a little bit different approach in the workload placement and scheduling in between and inside of the scheduler itself. So, just properly, you know? Yeah, so uh, before I go ahead, uh, thanks Alex and Matthew. And uh, there is one thing I really want to emphasize that such kind of experiment can be run on really modest type of hardware lab. And if you have your own interest in uh, checking some specific services or some specific workloads, not necessarily the ones that we were taking, you can do it yourself using the methodologies that are written and described on the performance documentation. Basically, the first link is about 1,000 nodes. Uh, we have our weekly meetings of our performance team on Tuesdays at 3.30 p.m. UTC. And um, there is some set of sessions I really want you to emphasize check this week on OpenStack Summit. Later today, uh, Red Hat guys are going to have a really cool session regarding Browbeat. Uh, this is a uh, testing tool that can check OpenStack scale and performance uh, using Rally and uh, several wrappers around it. Uh, tomorrow, there is a really cool session made by Grantis Neutron team uh, regarding OpenStack uh, Neutron being production ready for large scale deployments and they did really cool research around how many VMs can pretty modest hardware installation of OpenStack with Neutron handle and uh, how do the workloads behave on those type of environments and uh, how data plane and control plane behave. And on Thursday, we'll have our uh, OpenStack performance team session regarding what was done during Newton cycle and Akata planning because this is only one of the experiments we run. We have a bunch of stuff to share. And if you would like to know more, just join us on Thursday so we can jump to Q&A session. Any questions? Just please use mic if you want to ask something because it's recorded. Uh, when you don't benchmarking, uh, you have fake Nova and Neutron agents which report it instantly, isn't it? Uh, no, actually no. So uh, you mean about the INRIA or Mirantis experiment? Because I mean uh, about the compute part of the... No, thing. that was the actual agent. So they take time to respond yes. parse output of IP tables yes. and yes. so on? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. That was the kind of the main point of the using non-original fake driver and modified one, yeah. Have you tried to scale up uh, neutral server somehow? Uh, basically, we initially, uh, we placed a lot of the servers combined uh, on the, across these uh, 15 uh, nodes uh, in the containers. And later, we figure out uh, just using kind of not the full scale, like kind of 20,000 of nodes, when we put like kind of uh, workload with kind of 2,000 uh, 2, of uh, VMs, we take a look on which services consumption resource. And after that, we just moved all these kind of, you know, uh, service like it was first we moved conductor, then we moved the uh, neutron server and no API. Initially, we separated MySQL and RabbitMQ, but MySQL later will return it to the common pool because we've seen that the resources consumption not so big. If I understand well, uh, Neutron server was running on the one right? Yes, as the container also. We just dedicate all the resources. We tried to use two of them. That was not a big deal, but in our case, we didn't use the load balancing. I mean, in terms of the HA proxy, we use the just DNS round robin. So in this case, that would be, understand, um, API request would be split, but RPC would be consumed with both of them. So the load is kind of going just uh, split it out to, yeah, pretty, pretty stable steady. to both of them. So it's, that's also fine, yeah. What level, <coughs> what scale do you use cells? Uh, what level? Uh, we, don't, we don't use Thank you. Uh -huh. Hello. Uh, I've got two questions. The first is, uh, would using Nova cells help with the scalability of the scheduler? And the second one is, uh, did you look at how changing the frequency of periodic tasks would help with performance? Okay, so maybe I can. Okay. So we, in these experiments, we, we haven't looked at the cells. It's planned for the next cycle, actually. So here we, are, we only use uh, one, uh, the 1,000 compute nodes in the same pool. Uh, so maybe in six months we will have some results regarding the cells. Um, for your second question, yes, uh, we've uh, changed the timing of the periodic tasks and it helps a little bit because uh, of course the periodic tasks are not so, uh, doesn't load, uh, how to say, I, th I think 
Uh, the periodic task was running like every 10 seconds for some part and, and something. So if you increase that, you will uh, decrease the load on the database and, and all the load on the, on the RabbitMQ as well. So you can, you can find, with 1,000 load, you can find the load of uh, 100 cluster if you decrease the periodic task timing. So yeah, it helps. I could also add a little bit. So about the periodics, I mean, that's the kind of pros and cons of decreasing the time. So if you decrease, I mean, if you increase in the time, you're decreasing the load, but you're losing a little bit of the state of the current cluster. So mm -hmm. I mean, you wouldn't be able to pull it accordingly. So I mean, that for its effects, uh, so for the 10 minutes tasks, that's probably should be something uh, changed in Nova computer conductor to make it shuffled. Because as you've seen, we spawned all the nodes, and on because of that, we have all the spikes. Because if, if these nodes would be theoretically randomly launched, they would be have a different time, and it would be kind of ideally kind of, you know, Pretty static graph, yeah. but that's, that's not possible. There's no such random stuff. I mean, that's usually everything is spin up at the same, close to the same time. So it's maybe worth a try to add a random time to the, this 10 minutes periodic because it's pretty huge on load. For the 16, uh, for the one minute periodic of the conductor, you could decrease it, but the problem is that, well, based on this particular task, scheduler decide which compute node have amount of research. So if you increase it to the two minutes, then you will have the information only once the two minutes, so scheduler may do the incorrect decision based on that. So that's periodically, I mean, basically that time usually decrease it up to 10 seconds. So usually kind of to have a more or less kind of, kind of immediate information about the compute nodes, you usually decrease it. But it depends. I mean, it could be pretty flexible on that. So it depends on how many and how often you're placing a workload on your cloud. So if it's have pretty steady workloads and it's not changing a lot, you could, of course, increase the periodic task because you have kind of pretty monolithic cloud with no changes. But if you have some kind of, you know, CI, CD uh, processes in it and it's kind of spawning a lot of VMs, removing them, in this case, you probably would like to go with the pretty small uh, periodic uh, timings. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, just a question <coughs> about the like architectural question. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have in your setup an HA whatsoever? Okay. Nope. Okay. It, no issue. Okay. How many RabbitMQ instances you have? Just one? Just one RabbitMQ instance? Okay, so no mirroring of the queues, which killing the performance of the RabbitMQ, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We, we tried this cluster. It's kind of, it's not just killing it. It uh, adds a little bit overhead on the performance. Well, but somebody else from Gratis was telling us on the session before your session that it's killing like with three uh, members with the full mirroring of the queue, it's killing well performance by half. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. I mean, okay. but so if, 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 all, right? if, if yeah, all queues are mirrored, if all queues are mirrored, yeah, that's basically not the case. That's the, okay. that's, uh, that's the first case, and as you probably seen, that we have 20 core slot, modern top notch systems, even not top notch kind of mediocre servers have about kind of, well, let's say 40 cores. Right. In this case, it's also still work. And one main moment, we used RabbitMQ for all the services. In case if you're thinking that, well, it's maybe not enough performance of the, some particular specific RabbitMQ cluster, a uh, situation with containers allow you to spawn a different cluster for the different servers. Mm -hmm. Just multiple RabbitMQs for yes. different servers, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Uh, have you noticed or have you looked at the uh, Cinder volume service? This is actually no. like. The problem is with Cinder Volume, because well, from my experience, there's a lot of customers of Marantis using the completely different drivers for the Cinder. And there's a lot of different issues with each of them. Because so which storage did you use for this test? Uh, we didn't use Cinder Volume at all. All right. Mm -hmm. So the Cinder Volume was no, in this? No, no, no. Okay. okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Any more questions? OK. Yeah. Just please use mic, yeah. because it's recorded. Yes, yeah, sorry. So any special configuration of the database of the RabbitMQ will be used in this test uh, by the by default configuration? Well, we did a little bit, uh, we have uh, this small slide yep. with the kind of settings that you probably would like to apply. It's not mandatory, but it's highly recommended to go with because you may kind of not fit into the kind of uh, numbers that you already have. So for database, it's mostly about the connections. We did nothing beside the connections. For the Nova API, of course, 
max pool size because there's a lot of connections to the MySQL happens, so you have to have pretty big pool size for the workers. Uh, so for conductors, we already mentioned that's usually kind of uh, only number of workers. For scheduler, it's that's a general recommendation. So uh, to have a pretty well, quite fast provisioning of the workloads, you have to go with at least one scheduler per 100 compute nodes, and you will have this cons about the probably race condition when your cloud will be close to 100% load. So when you have, yeah. yeah, so if the saturation is kind of pretty high, you will probably will see the, sometimes the rescheduling happening because of the, some of the conductors, uh, some of the schedulers will try to put one v, different VMs on one compute nodes and one of them will be killed and rescheduled. So that's probably it. And about the Linux, you probably will have to go and tune up the maybe NIC settings. So we definitely tuned the NIC settings on the, all the servers because there's a lot of connections going on. So we changed the queue size, uh, we changed the max connection parameter. That's that's things was mandatory. But for uh, that's we do that we done that initially because we have everything on 15 nodes. So it's kind of it's pretty huge amount of load. But it's still true for the MySQL. It's still true for the RabbitMQ, especially for the RabbitMQ. And that's probably that's probably it. And we have run out of time. But sorry. We, we still, well, you could probably ask them, no? No, we just need to free room, sorry. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys.